Has anybody ever asked you what you want to be when you grow up? I think that's a terrible question. I think what we should be asking instead is who do you want to be when you grow up? Today, I want to share with you my story about how I went from feeling like a misfit in my own life to feeling like my life was a better fit for me. Over the years, I've had a lot of experiences like we all have, and, and they seem very random at times, but what I've come to realize is they're not so random at all. I really come to appreciate that everything happens for a reason. And this I know for sure. With each step we take, we learn something. Something that will inform another step along the way. Something that may not even have a rational fit in our lives until our lives are a better fit for us. Many of the lessons I've learned over the years, I think of them as puzzle pieces that have come together that have formed a picture of what my true fit life was meant to look like. One of the first puzzle pieces came when I was uh, working with a client in about 1991, and I was interviewing him, and uh, he said, once upon a time, my daddy started a company that made ham sacks, and he actually brought them, and these are what he brought. He says, we make a simple ham sack, and we make a super deluxe ham sack. <laughs> and I said, so you're in the ham sack business. And he said, with all the patience of a southern gentleman, no ma'am, I'm in the tubular knitting business. <laughs> okay, interesting, I kept listening. He went on to show me another product that they had, and this is medical stockinette. You know what this is like. If you've ever had a burn or a cast, you know what this looks like. So now my, my mind is starting to switch a little bit. It's no longer about ham socks. And he came out with one more product, which is a new one that he wanted help marketing, and, and so this has a sports medicine application. And what I learned real quickly was he was not in the ham sack business. And so I said, so, uh, you know, tell me about yourself. And he says, well, you know, I'm in the tubular knitting business. And what I learned that day was a lesson that stayed with me for many years. The lesson was he didn't define his company by what they produced. Instead, they focused on their core competencies. And I set out that day to discover what my personal tubular knitting equivalent was. The next puzzle piece came a couple years later when I was at a personal development workshop and we were given the task of coming up with our personal mission statement. And like a lightning bolt, boom, mine hit me. The personal mission statement goes like this. The purpose of my life is to open doors and build bridges. To open doors and build bridges, creating new possibilities for myself and others. And the more I thought about that, I realized that over the years, my, my whole life was about helping people move from their current state to a more desirable state. I built bridges by creating frameworks and methodologies and tools that closed the gap between where they are and where they wanted to be. My personal tubular knitting equivalent is that I'm a bridge builder. I'm a bridge builder. And if my talk ended right there, maybe you'd go away and wonder about that yourself. What is your tubular knitting equivalent? I work with the accounting profession, and over the years of observing what they do for their clients, I realize their tubular knitting equivalent is that they are storytellers. See, behind every business there are numbers, and those numbers tell a story. And a great accountant storyteller can not only help that business owner get to the heart of their story, but in doing so, help them write a happier ending. Great storytellers. And over the years, I have been very fortunate to work with many great accountant storytellers. Now, here's the funny part. I'm not an accountant. I'm not even good at math. I'm terrible at it. In college, I studied horticulture and design. Not at all related to accounting. I never imagined that I'd be working in business, let alone with accountants. And yet here I am 25 years later, having built a very successful business, helping accountants cross over the bridge 
from what we call compliance to reliance. So if I quit my talk right now, which believe me, I'm tempted. Um, <laughs> if you didn't get anything else from what I share with you today, I would hope that you would go out of here thinking about what is your tubular knit and equivalent, because I set out in search of that to figure out not what I could do, but who I am. What's the broadest definition of who I am? And hopefully that would do for you what it did for me, and that would inform every other choice I made in my life. But this was just the beginning of the story. In fact, it's just the very start of when I really started to see the puzzle pieces come together. In the year 2000, our accountants training program was taking off. It looked pretty good. I was booked out two years in advance. Everything was great. And then the universe decided to give me a very special gift. April 7th, about six weeks you know, after tax season, six weeks before I was about to go on the road to speak, I was laying in bed for a couple of days, and I had this sort of undefined pain in my body, and I thought I'd thrown my back out. And I got out of bed to take a shower, and without any warning, I had this ripping pain across my chest. And I thought I was having a heart attack. And it turns out that that pain I had felt was a blood clot that had traveled from my upper thigh up through my heart and out into my lungs, inducing a massive pulmonary embolism. Every doctor then and since has said it's a miracle that I'm still here. Don't get me wrong, I feel lucky to be alive, but I know something about that day that they didn't know. I was given the choice to live or die. As the doctors worked around me, and I can you know, sort of still feel all that energy of people trying to save me, as they were hovering over me, I was hovering over them. I can still see my skin turning gray as I navigated the space between life and death. Contrary to what you might think, I wasn't in pain. I wasn't scared. I felt bathed in love and light. And I had the distinct impression that I was given a choice about whether I wanted to live or die. Obviously, I made a choice. You can see I have a beautiful family that I wanted to come back to, but I had the sense that there was something more that I was supposed to be doing with my life. For the next 17 days, I remained in the hospital physically, but mentally, I was anywhere but. With the help of a morphine drip, <laughs> I floated in the ether, and I really contemplated that question about living and dying. And more to the point, the implications of having a choice at all. I'd been given the greatest gift of all, a wake-up call. And wake-up calls come in all shapes and sizes, but I can tell you the threat of death, like no other, can really get a fire under you. So that experience left me with a big question in my mind. Why am I here? Not what do I want to be when I grow up, but who do I want to be? So I got out of the hospital, and they did some genetic testing, and they figured out that I have a very rare blood condition. Short story, I'm born to clot. They put me on blood thinners and said, OK, from here on out, no sharp objects, no power tools the rest of your life. So what did I do? I started an art form with broken glass and power tools. <laughs> because I wasn't going to let anybody tell me ever again how I should live my life. And you know what? I wasn't afraid of dying either. Been there, done that. I was more afraid of not living. So over the next few years, my artistic flair took off, and I'm sure my husband would tell you he was glad I stopped playing with power tools as much and got into quilting and textile arts. And I was having a great time. Accountant, speaker, and trainer by day, and artist by night. I'd done a really good job of compartmentalizing my two halves of my spirit until the recession hit. And then everything went off the rails. I couldn't figure out what I was supposed to do. I stayed home, and, and what I'd done is I'd, I'd created these two worlds, my business world and my personal dreams world, and the what I do and who I am were missing the bridge in between. I'd built bridges for my clients, but I'd forgotten how to do it for myself. But the recession <laughs> 
afforded me that. <laughs> I was in a terrible place. On the one hand, I'd sit at my desk all day long and wait for the phone to ring because I wanted to close some business. At the same time, I was really glad it wasn't because it gave me time to step back and really think about who I was supposed to be and what that meant for my life. I dug deep. I worked with shaman and healers, and I asked those important questions about what my life's purpose was. And I learned a lot about certain talents and gifts that I'd taken for granted all those years. I entered into a year-long initiation as a shaman, and what I realized is that I'd been doing shamanic work with my clients for decades and never knew what to call it. I didn't know the source of that energy. I didn't know the source of the inspiration that I was channeling. And you know, you don't talk about it. It doesn't show up on the invoice either. You know, shamanic channeling, nobody wants to. <laughs> Not so cool, right? And so as I'm going through all of these shifts and changes and the recession and all these things that are happening, I'm really starting to ask myself, who am I supposed to be? And, and you know that saying, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. I was blessed with a number of phenomenal teachers who came into my life with the pieces of the transformational puzzle I needed to manifest a life that was a true fit for me. So the phone started ringing again. Once I stopped living out somebody else's definition of my life and started living my own life, the phone started ringing. And the good news is they were clients that had read my book, that knew my heart, knew my soul, and were ready to get to work. And so all of a sudden, where these two halves of my lives were not connected before, they were starting to merge. They were merging so much, so much and so fast, all of these really wonderful things were happening. I started keeping a synchronicity journal. I would write down all of those little things that would happen that all of a sudden started to form a, a, a picture. A trend started to emerge, and within that trend, I began to really understand what the rest of my life was supposed to look like. Today, you're as likely to find me in our yurt doing a vision quest with a business owner as you are to find me on a business stage speaking to accountants. See, I believe there's a loving force that nudges us forward on our path toward our true fit. Sometimes it's a smackdown, sometimes it's a gentle push, but it's all in service of helping us wake up and stay awake and not hit the snooze alarm. How many of you know what I'm talking about? That snooze alarm is the thing that gets in the way of us moving forward. And so I'm able to say that I'm living both sides of myself within one being now. When it comes to living your life, you have to ask yourself, nobody else is going to be as good at this as you. So if not you, then who? And if not now, then when? My gift to you today is that maybe you don't have to go through a life-threatening experience. Maybe you don't have to go through a financial pit like I did to learn what your true fit is. I would start by first figuring out what your tubular knitting equivalent is. Find out what the broadest definition of who you are versus what you do is all about. I'm a bridge builder. Maybe you're a healer. Maybe you're an innovator. Maybe you're an animal whisperer. Whatever it is, the world needs more of you. The second note I would give to you is that don't be afraid to follow your dreams. Take that trip to Thailand. Go hang out with the elephants. You never know what's going to be there when you get there. And the third thing is keep that synchronicity journal. Start to pay attention to that thing that somebody said a week ago, and then you read an article today. Do you know what I'm talking about? I think of those as breadcrumbs to my soul. Pay attention to the breadcrumbs. They will take you there. Because at the end of the day, with every step you take, we learn something. Something that will inform another step along the way. Something that may not have a rational fit in your life today until your life is a better fit for you.